What is up, everyone? Good Mike work back at you finally with a DVD review. It has been about a year and a half since I've given you a review on a WWE DVD. It's been about a year since I've given you a review on a WWE pay-per-view. This is actually one of my favorite segments to do, but it's been a busy year and it's been hard to kind of keep up with it. And this will be installment number 18. One of my goals for the upcoming year in 2017 is to give you more of these than I did last year because I really truly do enjoy doing them. And I've got another one that's on the back burner right now that's in production that I will be uploading in the next few weeks as well. And I'm going to try to get this segment back a little bit more consistent. I've changed a few things up about it. Kind of a new intro, new format type of thing. But as far as what I talk about and how I discuss the DVD, that's pretty much going to remain the same. First time listeners, welcome aboard. If you enjoy this video, please click that like button and subscribe to my channel. I also have a second channel. You can subscribe to that too. Follow me at Good Mike Work on Twitter, like my Facebook page, and go to GoodMikeWorkCommentaries.com where you can watch this YouTube video or download an MP3 straight to your device to listen to at your leisure. If you would like to listen to me on iTunes, I can also be found there and on Stitcher Radio as well. If you would like to support the channel and the brand, you can visit my Patreon page. Any donation amount, no matter how small, is welcomed. However, you are not required to donate a penny. All I want is your ears and your attention. Now let's get into the DVD that we're going to talk about in this episode, and that, of course, is You Think You Know Me, The Story of Edge, three DVD set. I have wanted to do this one for a long time, and I think doing Edge is perfect timing because this will be uploaded right around the time of SmackDown's 900th episode, which I believe Edge is going to appear on. And he's been retired now for close to six years, and I was doing commentaries back when he was, he was retired. And for those of you that remember my extremely primitive content from back then, uh, I was scarred by Edge's retirement. I really uh, didn't take it well. I felt really almost bad for him. It was just a career that I enjoyed so much, and I felt like ended very early. I also feel like I have a lot in common with Edge. I can relate to him. Uh, he and I have a very similar upbringing. He grew up in Toronto. I grew up in the suburbs of Detroit. So we even lived in a similar area on the globe. Uh, we're nearly the same age, and Edge and I had very similar experiences growing up as fans and some of the things we watched and, and uh, what got us hooked onto wrestling to begin with. I've had a chance to meet the guy a couple of times, which I've actually shared some stories of in previous commentaries. And he's even retired right now, up in the mountains of my former home state in North Carolina, living a great life up there, uh, recently married, he has a child, and I couldn't be happier for Edge and how at peace and happy he seems to be. So Edge has always been on my hit list for my DVD reviews. I get requests all the time. By the way, throw your requests at me. I know I get a lot of them. Probably my most popular requests lately have been The Rise and Fall of ECW, Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart, Daniel Bryan, and a few other ones as well I hear uh, very frequently from all of you. So I will do my best to pick the best possible DVD every time I do one of these. Uh, but I think I was long overdue for talking about the life and career of Edge. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to talk about the DVD and the documentary. I'll mention uh, the other two discs and the extras and the matches you get on this DVD as well. I mean, this DVD came out several years ago, so it's old. A lot of you probably have this. A lot of you have probably seen it. Uh, but if you haven't, pick it up on eBay or Amazon. It is well worth it. WWE always does an amazing job on these documentaries. I've said that so many times that one of my favorite things about WWE is how they produce these DVDs and these, and these life stories. And every now and then, you will get one that just doesn't measure up, or WWE gives the feeling that they just phoned it in. This DVD, however, was not the case. They did a great job. It was almost two hours long. Uh, they were really thorough, really in-depth. They didn't ignore anything. They didn't bounce around too much, and they addressed a lot of subjects. They pretty much addressed everything, including all of Edge's controversies and things like that. So I, I like when I watch these DVDs and these documentaries. I like it when WWE doesn't hold back. They don't pull any punches, and they just let it all hang out. Lots of people were interviewed for this thing as well. I'm sure I'm leaving out a few, but some of the names included Mick Foley, CM Punk, Trish Stratus, Christian, Chris Jericho, um, all of Edge's friends, Edge's mother, uh, Rhino, Matt Stryker, John Cena, Shawn Michaels, Michael Hayes, and even Lita, which was uh, awesome to see because there's a big history between Edge and Lita, which we will get into later on. Now, as most DVDs do, it starts out talking about Edge's childhood, where he grew up, you know, a little background and backstory on his parents and his family and where he lived and all of that. 
Um, he grew up loving professional wrestling, and he loved hockey, and he loved music. A huge Kiss fan, apparently. There was a bunch of pictures of him as a kid dressed up as Kiss. And apparently he got into wrestling, according to him, because he had lost a family member. He had lost an uncle at an extremely early age, a family member that he was very close to, and apparently he took it really hard. And it was around that time that he discovered wrestling, and he saw Hulk Hogan on TV for the first time, and it became his, uh, his little escape. And uh, he became hooked. He has a lot of stories similar to a lot of us. I mean, everybody, all of you listening to this have some sort of a story of the first time you laid eyes on wrestling. And Edge, given his age and when he started watching wrestling, you know, he and I are uh, are very close uh, to when we both started watching. I think I've got a few more years on him because I started watching before Hulk Hogan. But still, when I hear Edge discuss how he fell in love with this crazy form of entertainment, uh, it resonates with me because I can relate to it. I guess he met Jay, a.k.a. Christian, around the age of 12. Uh, they told a lot of stories of them being fans and the things they did, the pretend matches, which is something that I did as well. I remember wrestling on a trampoline or, or in the backyard with my friends. We actually had a chain-link fence surrounding one of my friend's yard, and, and we used to have cage matches on that thing, and we, we'd use the fence as the top rope. And you hear Edge tell stories of what him and Christian did. I think they used a couple of washers and dryers to set up ring ropes or something like that. And we're diving off of that. So every kid has a story similar to this, how they set up their pretend wrestling ring and fantasized about being a wrestler. It was really cool to see in the documentary, which they highlighted a lot, just how close and just how long Edge and Christian had known each other. And that has got to be such a thrill for them. Because I couldn't imagine, I mean, I had friends that liked wrestling like I did, but I couldn't, re I couldn't imagine me and my best friend both getting into wrestling and both succeeding on an extremely high level. I mean, both of these guys arguably are Hall of Famers. Edge, of course, already is. Christian definitely easily could be. He's a former world champion. Was never as, as big as Edge, but he really held his own and paved his own way. And he was not the Marty Jannetty of the group. You know, when you see these big tag teams and, and one guy goes on to superstardom, the other one just kind of fizzles away and disappears. Christian did not do that at all. He had an amazing career, which he should be very proud of. And I think it's so cool for the two of them to be able to do this and go through this journey together. And uh, the way they told some of these stories on the DVD was just awesome. I, I just thought this was such a well-done story. Now, I guess when they were teenagers, they somehow knew an indie promoter uh, locally there in the Toronto area. And they begged to do something at the show. Let us help out. Let us set up chairs. Let us set up the ring. Let us just be a part of it. Which, uh, apparently, the guy agreed and they eventually kind of found themselves inside the ring at one point during a show, during intermission, or while they were setting up. And they were actually get able to get into a ring for the first time and, and bounce around on the ropes and take bumps. And uh, Edge says that that's when they were hooked. After that, they really wanted to go through with this full-blown. And now that they were getting a little bit older, being a professional wrestler was something that uh, was now possible. All through high school, Edge was a huge wrestling fan. He had the long hair. He was even voted most likely to be WWE champion in his high school yearbook, which I think is just crazy. Um, his mother ended up taking him to WrestleMania 6, talked a lot about the relationship with his mom, and he has a very close relationship with her. Seems like a really cool lady. Raising him the way she did and making sure he was provided for and uh, going out of her way to make sure she could get him a ticket for WrestleMania 6, which was in Toronto, of course, at the Sky Dome, Hulk Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior. And uh, Edge was on the floor. You know, we've seen that footage time and time again of uh, Edge actually at WrestleMania 6 as, I don't know how old he would have been, I'd say 16 or 17 at that time. And he was a huge Hulk Hogan fan, and uh, he got to experience that show live. And I've been to a lot of great shows, and I've seen some pretty amazing things. Like WrestleMania 3, I was there. But WrestleMania 6 is an event that I would have really liked to be at. It's one of my favorite WrestleManias, that that main event with Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior. Uh, to this day, I think goes down as one of the greatest main events in WrestleMania history. I'm not even a big Hogan or Warrior fan. And I have to give those guys a ton of credit for how they pulled that match off, and how epic and monumental it was. And Edge got to see that shit live you know he got to see that live so i'm super jealous if you can't tell that edge was able to attend wrestlemania 6 i would have loved to be there now as they got older uh they started really going after it they started taking it seriously okay we want to look into becoming a wrestler where can we train where can we go they eventually found a, a school run by uh, sweet daddy Siki and ron hutchison and I guess the way they got in is that the school was doing a contest where uh, an aspiring student could write in an essay uh, discussing why they wanted to be a professional wrestler. And Edge was ambitious and motivated enough to write in 
and submit an essay to this school, and Christian did not. Apparently he pushed out or just uh, he was lazy or he just didn't do it, whatever the case was. Christian did not write in, and Edge did. And they picked Edge. They picked his essay, and he won the contest and was able to come in with completely free training. Talked about his training stories there, uh, even being in college, taking some classes on the side and uh, taking some broadcasting classes, which was super smart. Just great foresight to look that far ahead and say, you know... Talking is a big part of wrestling, and maybe if I take some broadcasting classes and learn how to speak and talk on the radio, that could help me in my professional wrestling career. Very smart. Once he was fully on his way with his training and started learning some stuff, Christian finally did wind up joining. I think he just paid the money and joined the school, and uh, they were going through it together. They showed a lot of indie footage of Edge and Christian working, and uh, you know we've all seen independent footage. We've seen it on all these documentaries. A lot of you guys have been to independent shows, I'm sure. And I always like to look at certain parts of the country's independent shows. You know, I used to live in the South in North Carolina, and uh, and I saw a few indie shows there. As a matter of fact, one of my very good friends to this day is still a referee on the independent circuit, and he's been doing it for years. And, uh, you know, sometimes they have a house of about 15 people that they're performing in front of. So you really have to pay your dues when you want to become a professional wrestler. You have to work literally in front of nobody. And uh, that's what Edge and Christian did. They paid their dues. That's why I think this type of wrestler is a lost art. It's a dying breed because you don't have too many guys that go through these paths anymore. This is where they would meet a few other wrestlers who were also... Uh, trying to make it and did experience a moderate amount of success in wrestling. Guys like Johnny Swinger, Joey Legend, and Rhino, who Edge and Christian apparently gave him that name when they met him. And they said, wow, you're a Rhino. That's your name. We're calling you Rhino from now on. Now, after a couple of years of this, uh, Edge says that he got his first call from WWE in 1996 to work a house show match against Bob Holly. And he says when he did that, he came backstage and he had his match and he got a ton of compliments. People were coming up to them and saying... You got something there. Keep working at it. You did a great job. You've got a bright future. And uh, he said he always appreciated that because those are guys that didn't really have to come up to him and say anything to him. And they did. They went out of their way to make him feel good about his performance. There's even a match. You guys can find it on YouTube. I know it's on the internet, but he had a dark match or uh, not a dark match. I'm sorry, but a squash match on WCW television as well. I think it was a uh, a worldwide episode. It was when they were in the soundstage there and the ring used to like rotate or turn. I don't even remember who his opponent was at this point. I don't even remember what his name was. I don't think he was using Sexton Hardcastle. Check it out. Check it. Look it up on YouTube. You can find it there. So he was getting a little bit of work. You know, Edge was only in the business for a couple of years and he was getting tryout matches with WWE and WCW. So that's a pretty big accomplishment. You know, when you have the right look and you have the size and you have the presence, you know, you kind of can be fast tracked to the big time because Edge, I think, was only in wrestling school or working on the independent scene for three to four years or something like that before he got the call to come to WWE. So that's pretty awesome. He gained some more experience after his cup of coffee with WCW and WWE. Uh, he worked more independent. Matches with uh, Don Callis, Bad News Brown, Rick Martell. Talked about going over to Brett's house and visiting him in Calgary and getting some advice from him. He worked all over Canada, even sleeping in tents on an Indian reservation and shit like that. So he shared some pretty intense stories about his road to the top and all of that. So uh, one thing you cannot say about Edge is that he did not pay his dues because he definitely did. Now, when he was finally signed by the WWE, they signed him to a developmental contract, I believe in late 96 or early 97, and uh, he talked about how he went up to Stanford and talked to JR and got the contract, and then they sent him over to the warehouse, which is down the road, uh, where they would work out a lot of uh, prospected talent, and uh, he got in the ring and worked out a little bit with Michael Hayes, and Michael Hayes gave him the green light and said, yep, this kid's got something, let's work with him and let's develop him. Now, they would take little breaks during the documentary and show footage of Edge at his home in Asheville, and they would revisit Asheville a couple of times throughout the DVD, just showing his his current home life, what he does. He loves the outdoors. Uh, He lives in a really wide open place where there's not a lot of people, and I used to live in North Carolina. Now, I lived on the beach, but I would drive over to Asheville a lot. It's up in the mountains. It's a beautiful little town, very liberal, uh, very much my speed, a ton of lesbians there. 
And uh, actually, the best weed uh, you would get in North Carolina most of the time came from Asheville or Boone, uh, which is also up in the mountains where Appalachian State is located. I think it's so awesome that Edge chose to come down to North Carolina to retire because, you know, I'm more of a warm weather type beachy guy. But there's something to be said for that mountain life and all the things you can do and the kayaking and the rivers and the wilderness and the hiking. And, you know, there's just so much of that. And for a wrestler who's been on the road for so long, surrounded by people, traveling the world, crowded airports, you know, just an extremely hectic life. I can understand why some wrestlers retire and retreat to very, very quiet, wide open places where they're not bothered. And it's such a perfect little place for Edge. I've been to Asheville several times. It's one of my favorite cities in North Carolina. If you're ever down in the South and uh, you're in the state of North Carolina, give Asheville a look because uh, it's a fun little town. Great people, great food, great beer, great weed. What more can you ask for, right? Now they get back to the beginning of his WWE career and they talk a little bit about the development of the Edge character and how they came up with the name and all of that. Edge says it was him that came up with the name Edge. Uh, he wanted something a little bit rock and rolly. He even thought his real name would have been fine. I do. I mean, Adam Copeland. I can picture that. I can picture world champion Adam Copeland. I think his his name was uh, perfectly acceptable to use. However, WWE, this is around the time where... You know, they're in competition with WCW and they want to trademark everything. So everybody's got to have a character and a name and something WWE can own. So it was really unlikely that uh, Edge was going to be able to use his real name. There's only a few select wrestlers that have gotten a chance to use their real name. And uh, they came up with the name of Edge. And I remember when it first, when I saw the vignettes and stuff and even his debut, I wasn't that big on it. I didn't really like the name. I'm like, Edge, what the fuck is this? And uh, they talk a little bit about that uncertainty in the character because nobody really knew what it was. He was supposed to be an enigma. He did this weird screaming thing. Uh, he came through the crowd. He was mysterious and all of that. But still, nobody really knew who Edge was. And it wasn't until he joined the Brood, which by this point Christian had come up. Now, I can't remember how long Edge was there before Christian got there. It wasn't that long. I almost want to say it was the same year, wasn't it? Edge came in. Edge debuted at SummerSlam 1998, I believe. And Christian wound up coming in just a couple of months later. And uh, they formed the Brood with Gangrel, which was awesome. Still to this day, one of my favorite factions in WWE. They never really did a whole lot. They were never in major storylines. They were like middle of the card. But the whole presentation of it and that entrance was one of the best things going on in WWE. Especially at that time when they're locked in this bitter war with WCW and the NWO and all these guys that defected from the WWE over to WCW. This was around the time that I started realizing that WWE is building new stars. And when Edge and Christian and Gangrel came up through the ramp with the fire surrounding them and the outfits and the music, which was great. That theme music of, of The Brood was one of my favorite WWE themes ever. I was thinking to myself, man, this is something you would never see on Nitro. And it really was Edge and Christian and Gangrel that made me realize what kind of a direction the WWE was going in. And uh, how WCW, they were going to be on borrowed time because this was some good shit. But much like the Nation of Domination and The Rock, you know, Edge really stood out in this group. And Gangrel was great, and Ron Simmons was great. But neither one of those guys were really, I think, the proper leader of that team. The guy that had the charisma, the guy that had the look, the guy that you were drawn to was Edge. Just like in The Nation, the guy you were drawn to was The Rock. And Edge never talked, if you remember that. He stayed silent there for the beginning of his WWE career, and he talked about the time that the WWE first put a microphone in front of his face, and he just delivered a couple of lines, and he was still very green and inexperienced on the mic at that time, but you could tell that the fans responded to it. He got a lot of uh, compliments and praise backstage for how he came off and how he delivered it, and I think that was when they started realizing that this guy can be a character all on his own, and we should give him the opportunity to talk more. And that was kind of when him and Christian broke away from Gangrel and they kind of became a tag team just on their own. And then they ran into the Hardy Boys. And I will never forget this as long as I live. I remember watching this pay-per-view. I had a couple of friends over, No Mercy 1999, ordered it on pay-per-view. And that ladder match had us jumping out of our seats. And Edge and Christian talked a lot about that. WWE still didn't know what they wanted to do with them either because this match, uh, a lot of people forget, was actually for the managerial services of Terry Runnels. That wasn't even the story. The story was how these two teams surprised everybody and the spots they were doing, the creativity and the innovation in that match 
was something that we had not seen. When you go back and watch it now, it looks like nothing because we've seen some crazy shit. But back in 1999, even though we had seen a few ladder matches, we had not really seen a tag team ladder match. And when Edge and Christian and Matt and Jeff were able to get so creative in there, I remember just marking the fuck out in my living room. I jumped out of my chair when they did the seesaw spot. Uh, which they would try years later in another tag team match, and Joey Mercury was almost killed doing something like that. So these guys were so good and easily the best performers WWE had had in environments like this. And uh, that match became legendary, and we would see what it would lead to, and we'll talk about that later on with uh, all the TLC matches and stuff. But that was just a straight-up ladder match, and that's where it all began. The next week on Raw, too, I remember watching that Raw. And uh, Edge and Christian and the Hardys. The Hardy Boys won that match, by the way. I'm sure you guys remember that. And uh, they got the big standing ovation on Monday Night Raw. Everybody backstage, including Mick Foley, Edge tells the story. He's told the story many times about when they came back from that match. He congratulated all four guys. And he goes, you guys just cemented your spots in this company. You are now a big deal because of that performance you just gave. And a lot of people were telling those guys that. And then the next night on Raw, it was so cool for the fans to also show those four guys that same appreciation. So shortly after that, the Dudley boys got in the mix, and they had just come in the company right around the same time of that ladder match. And going into the year 2000, you had this great tag team division that was really non-existent in the WWE prior to that point. You know, the tag teams were thrown together. The New Age Outlaws seemed like they were the only team that really stuck together for a long time during the Attitude Era. Everything else was just garbage. And now you had three solid teams, tag team contending teams that are all over. Edge and Christian, Matt and Jeff, and the Dudleys. Fans liked all three of these teams, and it felt like we had an actual division again and were developing some awesome rivalries. And that's where Edge and Christian were able to evolve even more in their characters because this is when they kind of went full-blown heel, was right around the beginning of 2000 because before then they were still trying to be baby faces but they both had unique personalities and edge was starting to get better on the mic you know christian would have his opportunity to speak as well and uh they kind of started breaking away from that baby face persona and becoming heels and getting a lot of heat and doing a lot of that with their mouth and wrestlemania 16 was a big moment for edge as well very emotional moment for edge and christian both could you imagine winning the tag team title at wrestlemania with your best friend who you grew up watching wrestling with your whole life. What a thrill for those two guys. Ten years after Edge attended WrestleMania Six as a fan, he's winning a championship at that very same event with his best friend by his side. That was pretty awesome. Now that was a ladder match for the tag team titles. And I'll never forget that image of Edge and Christian grabbing the belts down. They had built like a bridge, uh, two ladders, and placed a table on top of it. And they were both uh, standing up there, you know, holding the belts up in celebration. Pretty amazing moment and pretty great match. And a very rare bright spot on what I thought was a really bad WrestleMania. I did not enjoy WrestleMania that year, but that match was fabulous. And the WWE knew it because they would do it again just a few months later. They talked about the match at SummerSlam a couple of months after WrestleMania, which I was at. That was in Raleigh. I've told this story a bunch of times, too, in, uh, in various commentaries and Q&As. But uh, I was really close to the ring for that match, and I got to see a lot of those table bumps up close and personal. And uh, I'll never forget it. I will never forget feeling the ground shake when a Hardy Boy would hit the ground or something like that. I mean, I really felt like I experienced that match uh, about as well as you could, you know, to see that live so close up. Uh, was an amazing thing to see, and they were riding that wave. They would go into WrestleMania 17 the next year with a big TLC match, which really went out of their way to make better than the previous ones, if that was even possible. And uh, they talk about the big spot where Edge spears Jeff Hardy when he's hanging from the thing that holds up the belts, and just that image of them falling, and uh, you know Edge damn near knocking himself out, and the crowd popping like crazy. I remember watching that in my house that night, and uh, losing my mind. And it was probably one of the most iconic images or spots in WrestleMania history because it's something you see replayed time and time and time again, even to this day. And Jeff was the one that took the brunt of that bump. I mean, he's the one that had to land on his back from a very high distance. But the way Edge jumped off that ladder and speared him, and as they're falling, it literally feels like minutes are passing before they hit the ground. They then went on to talk about how entertaining Edge and Christian turned out to be 
as a heel tag team. How funny they were, their great sense of humor was able to come out on TV, and that's one thing that I feel sad about that we're never going to see today in modern times is that these wrestlers a lot of times don't have the opportunity to get their personalities or who they are in real life out on screen. And Edge and Christian had such a great chemistry together. Uh, Their sense of humor was off the charts, very similar to my own. They had some really hilarious promos, and they showed footage of a lot of that stuff the kazoos, uh, all the stuff he, they did with Mick Foley, the comedy bits, the throwing up, the chicken suit, you know, the Mick just got your so does, and all that shit that they did. Great stuff. The five-second pose, how can we ever forget that? It's amazing now with everybody has a phone in their pocket, but back then, you actually had to have the benefit of flash photography if you wanted to take home any memories from a wrestling show. And uh, the way that whole thing came together, they stopped coming through the crowd because they didn't want the fans touching them. But don't worry, we're still going to let you uh, experience us and get a picture of us, so we will pose for you in the ring for five seconds. Totally arrogant, totally egotistical. It was awesome. Got a ton of heat. I loved it. Entertaining as hell. And on top of that, it was funny, and it was fun, and uh, I miss those days. And I actually have some pictures of Edge and Christian doing a five-second pose. I used to take those disposable cameras. I'd stop at the gas station, buy three or four of them on the way to the show, and uh, I'd snap a bunch of pictures, and most of them came out looking like shit because you didn't know uh, what you were taking. You young people today, you have no idea, no clue how spoiled you are. The fact that every single one of us are walking around with a video camera in our pocket Blows my mind for somebody that grew up in the 80s. Now, like most tag teams, they don't last forever. And Edge talked about finally having to make the decision to split from Christian. It was something that they both discussed and both knew was inevitable. And I remember being sad they split up and thinking maybe it was a little bit too soon. Maybe they could have gone maybe one more year together. I think would have been all right. I was fine with them splitting up. But when they did, I don't think I was ready for it yet. And uh, that was when Ki- that was when Edge uh, went off and won King of the Ring in 2001. And Christian would wind up turning heel on him. And uh, when did they have a match? Was it SummerSlam of 2001? And I think the Intercontinental title was involved in all of that. They actually didn't talk too much about that match in the documentary. They didn't really talk about the feud between Edge and Christian. They just talked about how they split up. They actually did fast forward through a little bit of that stuff uh, to the following year where Edge would get an opportunity to tag with Hulk Hogan and win the tag team titles. And this is another thing where it just gets better and better for Edge. Now he is a guy that grew up a lifelong Hulk Hogan fan. Hulk Hogan had just come back into the WWE a few months before, back in 2002. And they had the idea to put the two of them together on SmackDown because this was during the brand split. And uh, they won the tag belts from Billy and Chuck. And that's... uh, That's another thing where I feel so good for Edge. I couldn't imagine being in his shoes, being a fan of Hulk Hogan, and then being able to win the tag team belts with him. It would be like if I became a wrestler and I was able to win the tag belts with Bret Hart, which I thought about becoming a wrestler for a long time and ultimately decided not to. I do not regret that decision, but if I did become a wrestler, I don't think I could rest. I don't think I would be able to be happy with my career unless I got to work with Bret Hart in some way, shape, or form. I would have loved to have a match with Bret. I would have gladly jobbed. He could have squashed me. I would have tapped out and squealed like a bitch to that sharpshooter with pleasure. Just to be able to be in the ring with him and take some of his punches and bump and sell for him would have been a true honor. So the fact that Edge got to work with his childhood idol and then they got to win titles together, I mean... You know, he talked about it when they won. He said, I was a nine-year-old kid all over again. I was in the ring. I was the biggest mark in the building, you know, uh, everybody there. So, and you could, and it showed on his face, you know, you go back and watch that match and, you know, he was marking out and it's, it's refreshing to see that because wrestlers, you know, they don't get an opportunity to mark out very often. So the fact that Edge was able to have that experience, I'm, uh, I'm deliriously happy for him. He was on a pretty big role and quite a big part of SmackDown when he got injured. And, uh, that's what they talked about next the big neck injury. Uh, He says that he noticed it for the first time in a ladder match with Eddie Guerrero. Something popped. Uh, He noticed some tingling, some numbness. Uh, Some of his muscles were starting to atrophy. Uh, He was 29 years old, and it sucked. And he had to tell the office, and they had to send him down to uh, the next specialist, the guy that did Austin's surgery and Lita's and Chris Benoit's, I believe. And the doctor said, yeah, you've got to have the fusion surgery, and uh, you're looking at a minimum of being out a year. And uh, Edge talked about that not sitting well with him. And that's got to be so tough, you know, especially when you you're, you have a career like Edge's that is really getting rolling. You know, he's got a lot of momentum and then it's stopped dead in its tracks. And that's why wrestling is uh, so much of your success in wrestling can be just by chance. 
It can just be by luck. How healthy you remain. Timing is a lot of things in wrestling. What gets a guy over, you know, if they succeed or not. A lot of it is right place, right time. Ability to stay healthy and not get injured at the wrong time. That's what we all felt bad for Seth Rollins last year. You know, he had such a great run with the title. And it was just cut right short. He wasn't even able to drop the title after having that great run with it because he got injured. So Edge went home, got the surgery done, and uh, just waited for his bones to heal because that's all you can really do with a neck injury. There's not much rehab you can do because it's bone trying to heal. It's not like you're rebuilding muscle or tissue or anything like that. So, you know, Edge was just uh, sitting at home. And I remember it was a sad year being without Edge back then in uh, 2003 or whatever year that was. I believe he came back, wasn't it the night after WrestleMania 20? Uh, they didn't talk about his return. They didn't talk about how he came back and speared Bischoff. Am I right about that? Was it Bischoff that he speared uh, when he came back? And he looked jacked as hell because he was probably on a lot of steroids during his uh, his therapy and uh, and healing and all of that. So he came back bigger, a lot angrier, it seemed like. And he talked about when uh, he had been back only for a short time and he had the big match in Toronto, his hometown, and he came out all excited and the crowd booed him. Booed their asses off for the guy. Fucking Bizarro Land, Canada. Same place where they booed the Rock out of the building versus Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania. They did the same thing to Edge a couple of years later. So that's what Edge decided to use as motivation to become a heel. And they turned Edge heel, and he embraced it, and it turned out to be awesome. He told the story of being put in the Money in the Bank match at WrestleMania 21. And I've heard Jericho tell this story, too, on a podcast or something like that. Apparently, Edge wasn't into the idea. He wanted to do something bigger. He wanted a one-on-one -on -one match, or maybe he felt like he should be in a title match, or basically more in a high-profile match, not just in a match where they're taking a bunch of guys they're not doing anything with and throwing them all together into one. And uh, he was being an asshole about it, apparently. And I think it was Jericho that was like, dude, will you shut the fuck up and do the match? You're probably going to win the thing. And uh, Edge admits on the DVD that he was wrong. He was uh, just bitter about the whole thing and didn't even want to be on WrestleMania. He said, just don't book me for the show. I'll do it next year. But finally, he wound up agreeing to do the match. And sure enough, he won the Money in the Bank. And back then, we had no idea what the Money in the Bank concept was going to turn out to be. It's not something that I would think, you know, 12 years later that we're still seeing a big part of on WWE TV. And it was right around this time that the whole affair with Lita was taking place. And I've mentioned this, too, because the last show I've ever attended in the WWE was 2005 during the build for WrestleMania 21. I was at a SmackDown event in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I just remember the fans, because that's right in Matt Hardy's backyard, and I remember the fans screaming Lita screwed Matt or fuck Edge or whatever the hell. So the the sheets and the and the news sites and a few people started catching wind of what was going on. And uh this was something where I gotta give Edge and and Lita and Matt Hardy a lot of credit. They talked a lot about this in the documentary. Matt Hardy was even interviewed for this thing. And to me still, I've talked about this before too. I think several times over the years I've discussed this feud and what went on with Edge and Lita. And it's so amazing to me that this took place in real life. They talk about how Matt Hardy was home with an injury and Lita and Edge started traveling together. Uh, they had the neck surgery in common. They both had that done. And one thing led to another and they wound up falling for each other. And uh, they both admitted that they fucked up big time. And uh, Matt Hardy was Edge's friend, and he really did him wrong. They had a ton of heat, which Edge didn't like because he was always a pretty fun-loving guy. He got along with everybody, and now he's kind of been ostracized. And he said he deserved it, but it was a really eerie feeling knowing that he didn't really have any allies. Matt was interviewed uh, a lot, and he went public with everything. I remember watching a big shoot interview with him just months after this happened where he told the whole story. I mean, he took three hours to tell this entire thing of how it went down. And Matt's a country boy. You know, I used to live in that part of the country. And, uh, you know, some of those boys down there, the way they deal with something like that, I was really worried that Matt Hardy was going to have some guys go find Edge and just beat the fuck out of him or hurt him or injure him or, God forbid, kill him or something like that. So, you know, uh, Matt Hardy was eventually released because of this, and I remember the internet freaking out about that. Matt Hardy was released unjustly. Basically, they figured somebody had to go, and you're not going to fire Edge. Even though he's the one that made the mistake, he is much more valuable than Matt Hardy. Maybe not broken Matt Hardy, <laughs> as we've seen. Uh, that character is absolutely freaking brilliant. Uh, but the Matt Hardy back then, you know, he wasn't going to offer what Edge did 
and it was just what WWE had to do. They had to release them, and it sucked, and it was not fair. And uh, the fans, you know, they were vocal. And, and one of the weirdest things I've ever seen, I mean, this was one of the few times that, you know, real life treaded into the fantasy world of wrestling. And WWE wound up hiring Matt Hardy back. I remember when Vince made the announcement that he had hired Matt Hardy back. Hardy had already jumped Edge, I think, backstage, which was another crazy thing to, to see. I still didn't believe that it was real. I mean, you knew that was a work, but it was still very shocking. And it felt like it was real. When uh, they did the spot backstage where Edge and Lita were just walking around and then Matt Hardy came out of nowhere uh, after being released and not being with the company for several months, he showed or several weeks, whatever it was, and he showed up and attacked Edge backstage and they had to pull him apart. And that's when it became apparent that the WWE had re-signed Matt Hardy and Vince McMahon would wind up making the official announcement like a week or two later. And uh, the fact that these two guys were able to work together is amazing. Uh, Edge talked about how he had so much heat and everything that he used that to his advantage. And that affair with Lita, that whole thing, I still to this day believe that that really had a lot to do with Edge's success as a heel because it gave him so much heat and he owned it and he was so good at it. He was so good at being that cocky, arrogant asshole and he looked the part. He was a great looking guy. He had a smoking hot girl on his side that he had stolen from somebody else and now he's got to go out and work a program with this guy and I'm thinking to myself, how are these guys working together, especially Matt Hardy? Edge, I think, feels legitimately guilty. I don't think he would have any reason to harm Matt Hardy or want to harm Matt Hardy. But Matt, on the other hand, has every reason uh, to take liberties with Edge and maybe give him a few receipts in those matches. I mean, they were working some brutal matches, including cage matches and everything else. So the fact that they were able to come together, they were all able to sit down, uh, it's just something I would not be able to do. If I was Matt Hardy, I would not be able to do what he did. To swallow my pride and come back in and work with the guy that stole my woman and lose the feud. I mean, he got a victory in there somewhere. He beat Edge in a cage on pay-per-view, I believe. I think Edge won the first encounter at SummerSlam. Matt won the second one. And then they did like the Loser Leaves Raw match or whatever in which uh, Matt Hardy also lost. So Matt still came out looking like the bitch of this thing. And, uh, you know, part of me wonders how the hell he did that, but part of me also admires Matt. Uh, that had to be tough to do. I still, to this day, can't believe those guys worked together. They were able to sit down and work it out. And I'm always curious what their relationship is now. I don't think Matt Hardy and Edge could ever be friends, but the fact that Matt was interviewed for this thing, the fact, the fact that Lita, after she had been broken up with Edge for a long time, was also interviewed for this thing and Edge openly talked about it, I would assume that uh, everything has been smoothed over and I guess looking back now, there's probably no hard feelings, but that's some pretty serious real-life shit that went on back then. So uh, I'm glad that it never got uglier than it did. I'm glad it never affected Edge, Lita, or Matt Hardy in really a negative way. They all wound up just fine. They're all happily married, I believe. Maybe not Lita. I'm not sure what her deal is. But we all know where they are in their lives now. And looking back, it's uh, no harm done. But at the time, it was a pretty big deal. And to this day, that feud still fascinates me. Now, Edge had the Money in the Bank briefcase during all this as well. And he held that for a very long time, nearly a year not cashing it in until the following January when they did the New Year's resolution or revolution pay-per-view or whatever it was. And uh, he came in and cashed it in on John Cena. He came out, he handed the briefcase to Vince. John Cena was bloody and beaten up from his previous match and he was able to take advantage and beat John Cena and really set the standard for how the briefcase was going to be handled. Because everybody thought when the Money in the Bank briefcase was first created that whoever won it would announce when they're going to cash it in. It was never a guarantee that they were just going to show up. After a champion has had a grueling match and just take advantage and win the belt easily without even breaking a sweat. And uh, what he did that night really set the standard for what the Money in the Bank has become. And had he not cashed it in that, in that way, I don't know if we would still see Money in the Bank matches today. And uh, it was an awesome moment for Edge. And you could see him. He was crying in the ring. He actually was still emotional, even though storyline-wise, he was a piece of shit to win the belt. He didn't have a grueling match for it. Uh, it wasn't a dramatic finish at the main event of WrestleMania with fireworks or anything like that. But it was still a lifelong fan accomplishing his, his dream and winning the world title. Now it's going to go down in the record books that Edge, Adam Copeland, the man that was voted most likely to be WWE champion in high school, is now WWE champion. I, I couldn't have been prouder for him at the time. I remember watching, and uh, I was a little jaded around that time about wrestling. I wasn't watching as closely because Eddie Guerrero had just died, and I was just starting to get fed up with a lot, especially with the deaths and, and some of the ugliness in wrestling, and I just wasn't paying attention as hard 
as I was, but I was still watching and I was still extremely happy for Edge because I remember him coming in and, and seeing him for the first time. I remember meeting the guy a few times and uh, and always admiring his career. And to see him now on top of the world was pretty awesome to see. It would be short-lived. I mean, John Cena would be the champion going into WrestleMania that year. Uh, but his first run was still uh, something that I'll never forget, even uh, though it was as short as it was. Now, before we talk about the rest of Edge's career, I think I'll talk a little bit more about the DVD a little bit and some of the matches and the extras they gave you in this set. Now, on the first disc, it's just the documentary, of course. And aside from that, they just give you a few extra stories on the DVD and the bonus features and stuff, which are really entertaining, especially the Ninja Star story, so go back and take a look there. Uh, the other two discs have some matches. Um, I'm not familiar with the Easter eggs on this DVD, and also, this is the regular DVD version. I probably am missing out on a few extras and Easter eggs and matches, uh, that cannot be found on this, that the Blu-ray versions do have. So, now the matches we get on Disc 2 are pretty decent. We get an independent match between Edge and Christian, Adam Impact versus Christian Cage. Uh, this came from the uh, South Indian Lake in 1995. They give us the four-team elimination match from King of the Ring, I believe, in 2000. It was Edge and Christian versus the Hardys versus TNA and Too Cool. So that's kind of an interesting match to put on there. Uh, we got a no-DQ match between uh, Edge and Eddie Guerrero from SmackDown in 2002. An Intercontinental title match on Raw between Edge and Randy Orton in 2004. Uh, we had that Loser Leaves Town match I just talked about a minute ago with Matt Hardy from Raw. That was from October of 2005. And that great TLC match for the WWE title versus John Cena from Unforgiven in 2006, right in the middle of that great John Cena and Edge feud. Disc 3, we got the street fight he had with Shawn Michaels on Raw in 2007. We had his WrestleMania main event match versus The Undertaker from WrestleMania 24 in 2008. A Pick Your Poison match versus Christian on Raw just about a year before Edge retired. Uh, we had a Fatal 4-Way match uh, at TLC for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship at TLC 2010. That was Edge, Kane, Rey Mysterio, and Alberto Del Rio. We had the Elimination Chamber match from 2011 with Edge, Rey Mysterio, Big Show, Kane, Drew McIntyre, and Wade Barrett. Is that the match where Edge won the title and then went in to defend it at WrestleMania against Del Rio? Uh, my history is off here. I guess I should fucking watch this match. How about that, huh? And of course, what turned out to be his final match, and that was WrestleMania 27, opening match of the card, and he successfully retained the title against Alberto Del Rio. And it was just a week after that that Edge uh, came on TV and retired, so we will definitely talk about that as uh, we finish up talking about uh, the career of Edge and the documentary. Now, picking up where we left off earlier with Edge's first world title win, this is what led to the big live sex celebration on Monday Night Raw. I know we all remember that. I've talked about it many times throughout the years. I think to this day it still rates as one of the highest rated segments in Monday Night Raw history, and I can see why. I mean, Lita was smoking hot. I mean, she still is, but back then, oh my God. So, you know, she's out there and they're getting naked, and Edge was kind of talking about uh, how he felt during that and his experience going through that, even... Uh, answering the question if he was aroused, and he's like, hell no, I was scared shitless being out there in a bed completely naked because Lita was legit naked under there. Creative had insisted that the only way it's going to work is if she takes off everything, and uh, it was pretty nuts and uh, still a pretty funny segment uh, to look back on today. When well, What was that now, 10, 11 years ago? Crazy. And then, as I also mentioned earlier on, his first run was a very, very short one. He would lose it back to John Cena just a couple of weeks later, at the Royal Rumble, and Edge talked about how it kind of pissed him off a little bit, and he had a chip on his shoulder after that because he felt like he could run with Cena for a long time, which I always enjoyed, the Edge and Cena feud. I thought they were just tailor-made to feud with each other because they're such opposites, and Edge discussed how he was pretty mad because they he felt that they could have gone further with that, and he finally gets his first opportunity to win a world title, and he doesn't even get to hold it for a month. I kind of disagree with the decision to take it off of him that quickly as well, um, but as we would see later on, it would turn out to be a non-issue, and it also led to the big match at WrestleMania with Mick Foley. Without Edge dropping that belt, he wouldn't have had that big match with Foley, and he took it very seriously, and uh, him and Edge go way back, of course. We talked about that earlier during the Attitude Era and Edge and Christian and all the comedy bits. Now they are super crazy focused, serious, ready to have a brutal match together. So both Edge and Foley are the types of wrestlers that I admire so much because they can play different roles. They can be funny and tongue-in-cheek and goofy and crazy, but they're not pigeonholed that way. They can also have a completely different side to them, and uh, it's something that very few stars can do. There's a few of them out there, you know, like Triple H and Kurt Angle and some other guys, but it's an extremely rare breed for somebody that can play pretty much two 
completely opposite characters and do them both equally well. I loved that match at WrestleMania. By that point, I, you know, I, I want to preface this by saying I've always loved Mick Foley and I respect him more than most wrestlers. I admire his integrity. I admire his career. Uh, I admire everything about the man, but I was getting a little bit tired of him constantly coming back. You know, he had come back a couple of years before and worked with Randy Orton. And when you think about all the wrestlers that went into retirement only to come out and wrestle again, Mick Foley was one of the worst. The only person that tops Mick Foley, I think, is Terry Funk. Uh, but Mick Foley, you know, was supposed to retire in the year 2000. And he came back several times and he would probably be even having matches today if the doctors would let him. But they say, you can't, uh, your brains are the equivalent of a bowl of oatmeal and we just can't risk you getting in the ring. Otherwise, I think he would have gotten in there. We even heard the most recent rumors a few years ago of him potentially working with Dean Ambrose and stuff. So even though I was irritated with Mick Foley and he just kept coming back and kept coming back to have these matches that we knew he was going to lose, it was still a great way for him to help get Randy Orton over and of course Edge over and this was a legendary WrestleMania match and it got nasty. We had thumbtacks, we had barbed wire bats, we had blood, we had flaming tables, uh, we had a beautiful set of breasts out there watching uh, at ringside with Lita. This match had everything a hardcore violent wrestling fan would want and it was brutal man and they took some serious bumps especially the finish uh, where Foley went through the flaming table. Foley tells a really funny story on the DVD where uh, he called his wife after WrestleMania, and the first thing she asked him is if Edge was okay, <laughs> which uh, I got a huge kick out of. So, you know, that's one of the things I admire about Edge when you think about his career, all the different things he's done. Back during his TLC days with the Hardys and the Dudleys, Edge was criticized for not taking enough bumps. You know, the Hardy boys and the Dudleys were doing all the crazy spots. But later on in his career, Edge got nuts. He got real nuts, and he more than made up uh, for any bumps he did not take during those matches, and he took a lot that shortened his career uh, during his time probably from 2005 to 2008. That match also really cemented his spot as a main eventer because that's what he was out to do. He talked about it. He was still a little bit bitter from dropping the belt to Cena, and he wanted to show WWE that they got a big-time money player here, and uh, he definitely did that in his match with Mick Foley, and that would lead to them resuming the feud between John Cena and Edge. A lot of things would lead to that because uh, this would have been 2006, so uh, Rob Van Dam wound up beating John Cena at the ECW pay-per-view and then got busted for weed, and that's when Edge took the belt from Rob Van Dam on Raw when they had to write him off a of TV and suspend him for 30 days or whatever it was. So Edge kind of won the belt back on a fluke, but then was able to resume a very legendary rivalry now when you look back with John Cena. And they had those two pay-per-view matches. The, the one was, I think, at SummerSlam in Cena's hometown. And then the next one, which I believe was Unforgiven, was in Edge's hometown of Toronto. And I remember watching those two pay-per-views. At that time, you know, like I've talked about earlier, I was a little bit, uh, I don't know about wrestling. I wasn't 100% into it, but I was checking out the pay-per-views and keeping a close eye on it. But I remember really enjoying those two main events. I thought it was cool the way Cena lost in his hometown and then Edge lost in his. And Edge talks about that match at Unforgiven, which was a TLC match that he was champion going into in his hometown as a heel in the very same place that they booed him when he was a babyface when he returned from his injury that really sparked his heel run. Now he's come back there as a heel and they are cheering their balls off for him. And when you go back and watch that match, they show it in the DVD. Uh, Edge is visibly crying in there at the beginning of the match when they're doing the introductions. You know, he's really taken back by the crowd's reaction to him and how they've kind of welcomed him back in uh, to Toronto after treating him like shit a few years before. So it got to him, and it, you could see it showed on his face, and it was hard for him to be a heel uh, when he's got tears in his eyes. But that match was one of my favorites, that TLC match. I didn't even mind the winner at that point. I mean, I was rooting for Edge. I loved Edge. But I remember when John Cena won, I just appreciated the effort. And even in Edge's hometown of Toronto, the fans were still cheering very loudly for John Cena. And I loved Cena's reaction after he, you know, FU'd Edge off the top of the ladder through the tables and he grabbed the belt. Instead of screaming or holding the belt up in the air or jumping up and down, he just almost had this look of depression on his face. Like, wow, that was one of the hardest fights I've ever had. I can't believe it got that brutal. And I can't believe what we did to each other uh, to fight over this prize. I really liked John Cena's reaction and facial expression after he won the belt. And that was one of the matches, I think, because I was never a big John Cena fan. I know you guys have heard me defend the guy lots because he deserves it. But back then, I wasn't too keen on Cena. But that was one of the matches that made me say, okay, uh, Cena is, is here to stay. Cena's a player. And uh, Cena's money. And he always comes through in those big matches. And even Cena's biggest critics 
can't say that he doesn't come through in big match situations because this guy has won match of the year like a half a dozen times. And uh, back then, this was one of the first matches that I saw of Cena's where I gained a little bit of respect for the guy because up until this point, I really didn't care. Edge puts Cena over huge in the DVD and Cena does the same thing to him. And uh, I always just think, looking back on that feud, that they worked so well together, and it was so fun to watch. I mean, aside from the title matches, they did so many other things as well. Remember, Edge went to John Cena's house and, like, slapped his dad. Uh, Edge got thrown in the river at some show. Uh, He changed the spinner belt. Uh, He put the Rated R star uh, logo in the middle there and made that spin, which I really like, because I think we can all agree that spinner belt is a pile of shit. They then go on to talk about his feud with Batista on SmackDown, which was set up on Raw when Edge had conned Mr. Kennedy into putting his Money in the Bank briefcase on the line. In a match, Edge winds up beating him and becomes the briefcase holder, and then he shows up on SmackDown in a match with Undertaker and, I don't know, maybe Mark Henry, and cashes it in like three or four days later. That led to his championship feud with Batista, and I think Batista was coming back from an injury back then as well. My timeline is all mixed up uh, during some of these years. And around this time is when he brought in uh, Kurt Hawkins and Zack Ryder, who were a couple of uh, young developmental kids that Edge had taken a liking to and kind of mentored a little bit, and he helped them out. And both of those guys were on the DVD talking about how Edge really went to bat for him and kind of helped them out with their idea. They're the ones that came up with this whole, like, Edge lookalike, crony, lackey-type gimmick, and it worked. Of course, as angled with Vicky Guerrero. They showed a lot of footage from that and the way they had their thing and all the times they made out <laughs> and all of that. It's funny how he went to from Lita to Vicky Guerrero, but Edge was always just, you know, he always gave it his all in all these segments, and he made every single thing he did work. He went into WrestleMania 24 in 2008 as the WWE Champion, of course, in the main event with The Undertaker, uh, that he talked a lot about how it was pretty much the defining moment in his career. You know, you work your whole life for that. You know, we've talked about everything about Edge's life up until now, and, you know, even winning the world title, and now here he is main eventing WrestleMania against probably the greatest WWE wrestler of all time and the greatest character of all time, with a legacy second to none in The Undertaker. So that's got to be a pretty big thrill. Becoming a fan at an extremely early age, attending WrestleMania six to watch your hero in the main event, training to be a wrestler, working the independence, the ultimate dream coming true, getting a call from the WWE to come work for them. Then you win your first belt with them. You break away and become a successful single star. You win a tag team championship with your childhood hero, Hulk Hogan. Then you go on to actually win the World Heavyweight title, and now you main event WrestleMania against an icon. I mean, it's got to be such a thrill for Edge. I mean, if I ever became a wrestler, Edge's career is the exact type of career I would like to have. I mean, what a journey. He worked with Undertaker in the Hell in the Cell, too. At SummerSlam later on, another match that The Undertaker helped make famous. So, you know, Edge Edge really did it all. And they talked a lot about how he really, I I said it earlier with the money in the bank, he set the standard for taking advantage. He was literally the ultimate opportunist. That was his nickname. And he won a couple of more world titles. I think he won a world heavyweight title and a WWE championship all within a couple of months. He did it at Survivor Series uh, in some sort of a triple threat match. And then he showed up at the Elimination Chamber a few months later and won another belt. So uh, I loved that underlying theme with Edge to where he would always seem to just show up and take control of the wrestling world without any of us seeing it coming. It was absolutely amazing. And uh, right around this time, they start talking about his declining health with his neck. He started mentioning that he was noticing some pain and some funniness. He just felt a little bit off. Uh, Something felt wrong with his nervous system. And he had about a year left on his contract. And he was intending on retiring after his contract was over in 2012. But as he's doing his build with Alberto Del Rio uh, for their match at WrestleMania 27, he starts noticing some more problems. He goes into the match at WrestleMania 27 to open the show against Alberto and successfully defended the World Heavyweight title and even mentioned that after the match he felt great. He thought he was going to be in pain. He thought his neck was going to hurt, but it didn't. But then he had to go get some more tests done right after that. And I think about a week had passed after WrestleMania and it was the following week's Raw where he had to come out and make the painful announcement, which still to this day, six years later, is incredibly hard for me to watch. I mean, you can't feel terrible for Edge. I just got done mentioning what an amazing career the guy had. But still, it would have been really nice to see him retire on his own terms. He mentioned that he just wanted to make it one more year. He was hoping he could just take some time off, heal a little bit, come back for one more final program or two before his contract was up, and then ride off into the sunset with a successful career. So all this really did was shave a year off of that. All it did was end it just a tiny bit earlier than he thought. Uh, But still, he mentioned in the documentary that he really wanted to finish out his contract. He wanted to see it through. That was really important to him. 
and it's a little bit of a bummer that he wasn't able to do that. But still, the guy had a very long and successful career. I mean, 15 years isn't that long. A lot of guys go 20 years, some go 25, some go 35 in some cases. But Edge had a nice career to where he experienced a ton of stuff in professional wrestling, and he still has plenty of time in his life to enjoy everything else life has to offer, uh, unlike a lot of other wrestlers who just can't stop and keep coming back and keep coming back. The ball was taken out of Edge's court. He had no choice in the matter. The doctor said, if you keep wrestling, you could die. And uh, you just can't do it anymore. So, you know, the decision was easy for him. And his speech was tough. You know, you saw the tears in his eyes, and he really didn't want to leave. He wasn't ready to leave just yet. But I think he would have been much more at peace with it if he knew it was coming and he had time to prepare for it and uh, and just get ready for another life. This kind of happened at the spur of the moment. He went to the doctor. Okay, that's it. You're done. You've had your last match, and uh, it's over. And it was kind of a big shock all at once, and I can't imagine how hard that was for him. He talked about Steve Austin calling him because Austin went through the same exact thing and uh, gave him some advice. And he said, the last thing you need to do is go sit on your ass and be depressed. Get off your ass. Get out there. Enjoy life. Smell the fresh air. Uh, You'll be amazed how much you actually enjoy it. And uh, Edge credits Austin with really helping him stay away from that kind of depression and that negativity. And, uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, he lives in Asheville. He lives in a wide open place. He's always outdoors, hiking and enjoying family life and enjoying the fruits of his labors, and Edge is the one guy, I've probably mentioned this a hundred times in my commentaries over the years, is that I just don't understand sometimes why they can't enjoy life after wrestling. A lot of them have financial problems, a lot of them have drug problems, a lot of them can't let go and keep coming back, and Edge is one of those guys that didn't do that. He has lived life to the fullest, and he seems legitimately happy in his post-wrestling career. Plus, we get to see him every now and then. He still pops back in on WWE TV every now and then. He's got that hilarious show with Christian on the WWE Network, and so we still get to see Edge. Plus, we can remember his great career with DVDs like this. So it truly was a pleasure to sit here and talk to you guys about the career of Edge because, you know, I admire it so much. Look at the different characters and the evolution of his personality and who he was in wrestling. Uh, You know, he has one of the best careers we have ever seen. And it could have easily gone in the other direction and not worked out for him. So I'm really glad that he wound up signing with the WWE back in 1996 instead of WCW. I still think Edge had the look and the personality to get over no matter where he was, but him being under a WWE umbrella was definitely better for him. I have the utmost respect for Edge uh, in every possible way. I respect his wrestling career. I respect his personal life. I respect the mistakes he made and how he learned from those mistakes and how he is a success story. You know, there's not many of those. Thank you for joining me on this journey through Edge's career and a look at this DVD. Like I said earlier, if you don't have it, pick it up. I'm sure you can get it for just a few bucks on Amazon or eBay, and it might even be on the WWE Network. I'm not sure. They have that Beyond the Rings segment where a lot of these DVDs are available on there, so it should not be hard to find. Most of you, I'm sure, have seen this, but if you haven't, please check it out. Leave me all your comments and your memories of Edge, what he meant to you, some of your favorite moments and title victories and feuds that he had, and uh, you know, any thoughts on his overall career would be much welcomed in the comments section. So uh, thank you for listening. The next DVD review will be up in just a few weeks, and it should be just as fun as this one was, and it's another wrestler that I've really wanted to do a review on their life story uh, for a long time, so it should be a lot of fun. I will catch you guys in just a few days. Thank you so much for listening, and long live the Rated R Superstar. Peace.